All right, so we just wrapped up um, just wrapped up fluid statics. Now I want to get into fluid dynamics. And, and really all that means is it's just how fluids flow. Um, what, we just, what we just looked at was just normal air pressure. The wind isn't blowing. Uh, there are no fans on. Um, and we, we got in with the concept of pressure. The next, the next thing I want to do here is look at um, compressible versus um, incompressible. Fluids. Now, typically, um, well, when you um, like in an automobile, you, you you've probably heard of what's called the compression ratio. It's it's basically, uh, you know, you've got your you've got your cylinder, um, air and gasoline both come in, the um, piston's moving up and down, it squishes down. You might have you know 10 to 1, 20 to 1 compression ratio. That basically means you take all of that air fuel mixture, squish it down into a smaller volume. If you've got a um, diesel engine, you squish it uh, close enough that it gets hot enough it actually self ignites. If it's a gasoline engine, you, the fire, the spark plug fires, and um, off it goes. So that's a compressible fluid. Air is an example. Typically, water is thought of as an incompressible fluid. It's not exactly incompressible, but, but basically what happens with, with water, um, you, you push it this direction, and it, and it squirts out in these directions. But it goes somewhere. Now, it's not exactly true, and the, the, one, um, the one thing I want to show you is this thing called the bulk modulus, because it takes us from fluid statics into fluid dynamics. So let's look this up. Bulk modulus. So just like the heat transfer coefficient for materials last time was a um, material constant, it's an intensive variable, so is the bulk modulus. And I'm just going to dive into the engineering toolbox. Um, let's see what it has to say. So here's aluminum, brass, steel, iron, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, water. Um, OK. I'm not going to require you to, to know this equation, but I do want to explain which each, what each thing is. The, the bulk modulus is, again, it's how compressible that material is. So if I go up here, let's just look at some of these metals before we look at water and um, water and air. Which of those is the has the highest bulk modulus? I'm looking at stainless steel. Kind of means it's the least squishy. Which one has the lowest? Aluminum. Not to be unexpected, right? You kind of think, okay, aluminum's kind of light. It's not very dense. It's 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 squishier than than steel. So. I'm just going to write uh, the bulk modulus of most metals. Oh, and magnesium is even less there. Uh, bulk modulus of most metals is about 100 gigapascals. We already looked a second ago at what a kilopascal was. So air pressure is a 100,000 kilo, kilopascal. Obviously, you know, air itself is a spring. And we'll see what the bulk modulus of air is in a second. But I'm just going to write down for a point of reference uh, bulk modulus for metals is about 100 gigapascals, or 100 billion newtons per square meter, if you want to really squish it. So, and I'm going to write it as K. So you can think, and I'm sorry again, <laughs> use K for thermal conductivity. This is a capital K. It's bulk modulus. There's, there's your K for bulk modulus. Uh, K for metal, we're looking at about uh, 100 gigapascals. So that's the first thing that comes up. So let's, let's do bulk modulus of water. I think the bulk modulus of water is going to be more or less than steel and metals. 
Water more squishy, less, probably less. I'm going to guess less too. I think most people would. Let's just see what we got here. Acetone, petrol, seawater. Yeah. Um, so there it is. 2.5 times 10 to the 9th. 10 to the 9th is a giga. So as expected, water is springier, if you will, than steel. So I'm going to write that one down too. So there's our, there's our steel at the bottom. So KH2O equals 2 gigapascals. And let's look it up for, um, for air. And again, is it going to be less or more than water? It should be a lot less. There's some, uh, there's some number there. I don't know what's going on with that. Let's, let's cruise down here. Find air. All right, there we go. Um, 1.42 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Uh, 1.42 times 10 to the fifth. So I'll write that out. And there, there's our, um, there's our water again. Uh, 1.42 times 10 to the fifth. Uh, 1.42 times 10 to the fifth. Let's just let's just look at the ratio and see how many more times compressible air is than water. So we'll do a little bit of um, Microsoft Excel. If you want to plug this in your calculator, you may too. And this is going to help us when we get into our uh, fluid dynamics. Because we'll realize, okay, um, everything's a spring. Uh, water or air is springier than, than um, air. So I'm going to, this is going to equal 2. So 2 billion in Microsoft Excel is 2E9. That's 2 billion. So 2 times 10 to the ninth. That's 2 billion. Divided by 1.42 E5. That's how you write uh, 1.42 times 10 to the fifth. So air is uh, 14,000 times springier, or less springy, depending on how you want to define springiness, than, um, than water. It's a thousand times less dense, but that's its uh, bulk modulus. Okay. Now let's let's move on, and let's let's start to dig into the Bernoulli equation because what that's going to do is help us um, um, help us understand fluid dynamics. So um, we've we've already talked a little bit about gas versus liquid and the fact that they're both fluids. Uh, now let's just go ahead and dig into a little bit of Bernoulli. Anybody seen Bernoulli's equation before? It's kind of complicated, but on the other hand, it, it's really the, um, it's, it's the gateway to fluid dynamics. So let's, let's look it up. And I will carefully go through each term. I'm hoping the hyperphysics version is the same as the, uh, the, the, NAS, the NASA version. Hopefully NASA is not making up their own, uh, their own math. Uh, really calculation, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I don't want that, to get that crazy. I just want to see the equation itself. Different version. This is this is if we assume no change in height. So in this case, there are only two terms on each side. This is if you've got um, 
flow going through a horizontal tube. I actually want to show you the slightly more complicated. Uh, so I'm going to keep that one open too. I kind of wanted to try to dodge. Um, same thing as P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Um, what's what? No, I don't think so. Are you, are you talking about mom, like momentum? Yeah, no, it's not. This, so, no, uh, PV equals NRT, that's, um, that's the ideal gas law, and it's just for pressure, volume, and temperature. This one actually deals with flow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, this equation, it's a, um, it's a pressure equation. It's also a conservation of an energy equation. And let, let, me, let me show you, uh, let me just show you how and why. So I'm going to write this down. P I'm just going to make my little cheat sheet a little more cheatable here. Scroll that up. This guy here. Okay. So again, this, this has a lot of applications when we, when we do our blower door test. This is what's going on inside this, this whole gizmo. So uh, P equals, oops, sorry, uh, P plus one half. Now, that is, um, that's not a P, that's a rho. It's, it's density. So P plus one half rho. And if you want to make that look a little more like a P, you can put a, you know, a, a little stem on it there. One half rho V squared. Now, I usually like to use a, a lowercase V, but a lot of times you'll see the uppercase V. It's velocity, not volume, <coughs> plus rho G H equals a, a constant. Now, I want to I um, explain one more thing. Hopefully this helps. It always helps me. Um, what, so fundamentally, what is pressure? When you think of pressure, like what, what is it? It's, it's kind of force. It's um, um, the way I like to think of pressure, it's actually, it's actually energy per unit volume. It's how much mechanical energy is inside whatever you're talking about. Um, pressure is, in fact, energy per unit volume, and I'll, I'll show you why. I mean, I, I already showed you up here in this, in this um, diesel or um, gasoline cylinder. You had, you had to squish that fuel, you had to put some energy in, right? You squished it down, it blew up, it gave you some energy back. Well. Let me show you why pressure is actually energy per volume. Because I think we all, you know, after last week's lecture, kind of have an, an idea of what energy is. So let's, let's start again with what pressure is. Um, um, it's either, you know, it's either pounds per inch squared or it's um, newtons per meter squared or more generically, it's just force per unit area. That's what pressure is. And we, we just beat that to death over the last hour. Now, if I multiply force times distance, what do I get? I'm going to multiply a force times a distance. Any idea what that is? Here's an, it's, it's not acceleration. It be the volume of the PSI for that distance. Uh, close. That's that's my next. That's gonna be my next question. It's not the volume. So here here's you know here's per, here's per feet. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what we're doing. I mean, this is what we do every day. We walk around. We drive our cars. We you know shuffle the furniture around the house. I'm pushing on this with a force, and I moved it through some distance. What did I just do? I did some work. Work and energy have the same 
units, the same dimension. So all I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to multiply force times distance. And I know I'm going to have energy or work on the top. Well, in algebra, you learn whatever you do to the top, you have to do to the bottom. So I'm going to mul multiply area times distance too. What do I get when I multiply an area by a length? I get a volume. So pressure is just energy per volume. So Bernoulli's equation just tells you whenever you put some energy into a fluid somewhere, it's going to come out somewhere else. That's all it is. So this is so we know that this is pressure. And hopefully I convinced you that pressure is just energy per volume. One second. Um, this is density. And if, if you took um, NRG Y 101 or, or if you've been in a science class, this is looking a lot like 1 half mv squared. This is just kinetic energy. That's all it is. It's just, it's just the energy in the moving fluid. It's the energy blowing through the wind turbine. It's the energy pushing your car backwards. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, that's what that is. And what's this one? Well, this is just gravitational. So what, um, so what Bernoulli was able to do is say, I've got um, you know, static energy. I've got kinetic energy. And then I've got gravitational energy. So think of this static energy as like the pressure inside your air compressor. This thing is one half m, this one half rho v squared is the air squirting through the, the tank to fill up your car tires. And then this is, well, if you lifted the thing up or not. Usually that, like we saw a second ago, usually that's negligible. But I wanted to throw it in there to let you know that this is a conservation of energy equation, Bernoulli's principle is. OK. Uh, question, comment? Nothing? Okay. Um, let's, just, let's just do a simple, uh, let's just run through a simple problem here. Yeah. This one's, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the pitot tube is actually a really good one. Um, so let me make this a little bit bigger because, in fact, when we do our blower door, um, a lot of blower doors actually have a little pitot tube in them. Or a big pitot tube. I don't know. It's just there's a, there's a pitot tube inside the thing. Okay. So what we're looking at um, in this particular example, again, it's just it's just going to be conservation of um, conservation of energy. So let's look at each one of these little uh, little things in in um, in sequence and see if we can't. A pitot tube is a type of manometer. It's just one type. You could also have diaphragm based or whatever. There's a lot of different styles. Okay. So again, um, another way to write another way to write Bernoulli's equation is like this: uh, P1 plus one half rho one h one plus um, rho 1 g h 1 equals p2 plus 1 half rho 2 h 2 plus rho 2 g h 2. That's just another way of writing that the, that the energy is constant. So we wrote it before. The pressure plus one half the density times the velocity squared plus uh, the density times gravity times the height is some constant. Well, let's take a look in this particular um, in this particular example. So what we have 
is um, we've got some um, some velocity coming in right here. We've got some pressure, and this is just the uh, the pressure at infinity. You know, it's, it's the it's the um, atmospheric pressure. You also have some uh, some static pressure here. So what we're what we're really trying to get at is um, measuring the velocity of this fluid by measuring the, the change in height. You know, and, and fundamentally, this is just you know, a little philosophical aside, really the only thing that human beings can really measure is a, is a change in, in distance or displacement. I mean, we can't really, I mean, yeah, we can measure voltage, but when you go to measure voltage, you're, you're watching some little arm move somewhere. Uh, when you go to measure pressure, same thing. You're watching some, some dial move. If you want to know what, um, how much something weighs, the same thing is true. You stand on the scale, something's got to move. So fundamentally, really the only thing we ever measure is dis you know, displacement. Even though we're like measuring velocity, pressure, all these other things. Like when, you, when it comes right down to it, it's just where, some, where one thing went and to a different place. Okay, so we're going to measure the velocity inside the tube by measuring how, uh, how much the height changed in the tube. And then uh, you can imagine inside your um, blower door, there's a lot of different ways to, to measure this. So you could have uh, you know, light shining through it, depending on how much light goes through. Um, you could have a little, a little bobber in there that's sort of you know, moving some other dial that's giving the pressure. So anyway, this is the, um, the pitot tube. You might even see these sometimes on the outside of airplanes, little tiny things sticking out, measuring velocity. Okay, so let's, um, let's just take a look here. So um, in this particular situation, I'll draw this as kind of as simply as I can. So in each case, um, we've got to have um, different pressures. So I'm, I'm going to call this out here. I'm going to call this P1. I'm also going to call it uh, rho 1. And I'm going to call it, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. I think I made a little, little typo in my equation. You guys should have caught me. These are, um, these are Vs. squared, V2 squared. I'm going to have some uh, V1. So I've got some pressure, some density, and some velocity of, of the fluid. And again, we're just in a, in a wind stream out here, so this thing is sticking out in the wind. Down here, um, we're going to have, again, some pressure 2, some density 2, and then some velocity 2. And on this side, since, since this right-hand side is connected to the uh, stuff coming in, I'm going to call this H1. And I'm going to call this one over here um, H2. So uh, in, this, in this case, um, this chunk of air outside the tube is actually attached to the same outside air. There's, there's, no, there's no change in pressure. So I can right away write down that uh, P1 equals uh, P2. In this case, just referring to this figure, they've written this as P infinity and um, PS. Okay, I've just, used, I've just used one and two. So those are the same. Um, we can also say that V2 equals uh, equals zero. There is no no wind 
blowing around at this other end of the pitot tube. And obviously, the gravities are the same. And since we're, we're just dealing with air, the, the densities are the same, too. We're not assuming that this is like blowing so hard that the, that the air is actually changing in density. It might be a little bit, but not enough to affect the equation. So from there, we can write um, P1. So we're, again, all we're trying to do is, is solve for the, um, for the change in pressure as a function of the, or actually, sorry, we're trying to find the velocity as a function of the change in height. So P1 plus um, one half um, rho one, and then here's, um, here's V1 squared plus uh, rho one G H1 equals. Now, I'm not going to write P2 again, because I already know that P2 equals P1. So I'm just going to write P1 again. Don't need to keep P2 kicking around, because it equals the same thing as P1. Plus, one half. Um, I know that the, the densities are the same as well, so I'm just going to again write um, rho, um, rho 1. And then V2, I already said is zero, so that's zero squared um, plus, sorry, I'm running a little bit out of room, uh, rho one G H two. Okay, so simplifying, the pressures disappear. Um, this guy I'm gonna keep around as one half rho one V one squared uh, plus, um, again, this is just going to be rho 1 g h1 equals rho 1 g h2. So I, I, did, I had six terms. The two pressure terms went away. The right-hand velocity term went away because there's no velocity at the... Uh, left-hand side of the tube, and I'm just, I'm just left with, I'll um, make sure I got them all here. Um, yeah, and I'm just left with three out of my six original terms. So from there, um, I'll, just, I'll just keep going. I'll write uh, one-half rho one v one squared equals, now I'm going to bring this over on the other side, and I'm just going to combine it as uh, Row one, G. Now I can just write H two minus H one, and remember, the only thing we ever really measure as scientists is a change in distance or height. That's what that is. Um, and after that, the uh, the rows disappear, and I'm just left with uh, V one squared equals two G delta. H or uh, V1 equals the square root of 2G delta H. Are the units correct on that? What, what, are the, what are the units typically on G? Meters per second squared, uh, feet per second squared. The units on H are just, are also length. So let's just do a really quick, so after doing that much math, it's usually a good idea to go back and say, is it, are the units at least consistent? So I know that gravity is measured in uh, you know, meters per second squared. I know that height is measured in meters. I take the square root of that, and I just get meters per second, and we know that's what a velocity is. Okay, so just to review what we, what we did, um, after covering fluid statics, we moved on to fluid dynamics. And Bernoulli's equation is your bread and butter um, fluid dynamics equation. Doesn't matter if you're talking HVAC, cars moving, airplanes flying, um, balloons popping, <laughs> whatever. Uh, Bernoulli's equation is, is almost always going to be your, your go-to um, 
go to conservation of energy. I use the pitot tube because it is so funny to listen to that someone's saying the word pitot tube. <laughs> I'm not sure why. And, and manometer. <laughs> manometer, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the point is, uh, whatever's happening at the inlet is also happening at the outlet. Or whatever, um, whatever energy is lost as pressure is coming out somewhere else's velocity. Or whatever is going in as gravity is coming out somewhere else's pressure. So again, all the way back to that very first half hour that I did you know, last Tuesday, it's conservation of energy. You cannot create or destroy it. Did one really simple example and actually measured velocity. Um, as a function of change in height, and we verified our units. Now, how is this applicable to the blower door that we're going to do here in a few weeks? Why, why do you care what the velocity is in a blower door? Yeah? Because you got, you, your square meters of air, so you have to have that velocity to push those meters out wherever it's going to be. Yeah, so from an from a energy efficiency standpoint, when you're running your blower door, do you want a high velocity or a low velocity coming out your blower door? Well, you need a high velocity to measure something, but in general, in your house, do you want a high or a low velocity of air leaving your house? Low. Low, low. yeah, right, right. So to, yeah, so, so what's going to happen in the... Um, in the, in the blower door test, like the house will be pressurized with the blower door, and what, what it all is doing is keeping track of how much air comes in versus how much goes out. So it's coming in the front door, and it's leaving somewhere else, or a lot of other places, through the window, through the attic, through the, the, the trim, through the um, electrical outlets. It's, it's going to go somewhere. If not, you know, if, then you've, you've got a really well-sealed um, well uh, well house. Okay. So there's Bernoulli's equation as it relates to manometers, as it relates to um, blower door tests. So that's, that's um, fluid dynamics in a nutshell. Uh, any questions at all on, on uh, fluid dynamics? I'm going to do, do a couple other little examples on air moving through a house. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs>